welcome uh, to today's uh, webinar. We've missed you all. It's been a month or so since we held an event. Um, so today's session is called, Have You Found Your Low Hanging Fruits? Um, I'm Suze and delivering our session today as usual is uh, Jen Badger and Ian Cashin, our in-house R&D tax experts of the scheme and all things eligibility related. Hi guys. Um, we get asked frequently by accountants and other business advisors within our network about how to easily uh, determine the top targets within their client base that may be eligible for R&D tax relief so they can understand where to focus their efforts as they build this side of their business. Um, so today's session is specifically aimed at firms who may already have um, a portfolio of clients, uh, but they're not yet engaged with them for R&D. Jen and Ian are going to chat through um, what immediate indicators um, you can use to identify who these firms are, how to approach them, um, tips on coaching them through the claims process, and also um, using technology to enable you to offer a robust and compliant end-to-end -end service. Um, here at Whisper Claims, uh, we're passionate about empowering our community with confidence to implement or scale their in-house R&D tax service. Um, having the right foundations in place is key, and the fundamental to this is um, a strong, reliable and consistent process. Whisper Claims has been designed by our team of R&D tax experts to offer you this straight out of the box so you can focus firmly on embedding yourself as your client's trusted R&D tax advisor, whilst also generating a new revenue stream uh, from your existing client base. Um, as usual with these sessions today, um, we'll be happy to um, take questions uh, really at any point, um, but the majority of the, the Q&A will be at the end of the session. So do have your Q&A boxes up um, ready to go um, to ask us questions. Um, we do prefer that rather than the chat box because it just helps us uh, with the flow of questions as we go through the session. However, if you do want to chat to us or all the audience as a whole, um, feel free to pop um, any questions you have um, in the chat box too. Um, that's it for me for now. Um, over to you, Jen and Ian. Cool. Thanks, Suze. Um, so yeah, as Suze said, today is all about how you can review your client, pipeline your client portfolio and identify which clients to focus your efforts and attention on in the first case. So what we'll talk about, I'll do my usual eligibility refresher, um, and then we'll talk about the ways that you can review your client portfolio, different tools you can use, different ideas, different things that we do. And then we'll talk a bit about kind of other things you might see in client uh, documents, that kind of thing that might indicate they're doing R&D, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. So First of all, just a quick refresh so that we're all on the same page when we're talking about eligibility and eligible clients. So what HMRC are looking for is that a company is, first of all, working in a field of science and technology. So they could be doing amazing research in the field of economics, but that's not a field of science and technology by HMRC's judgment. So you can't claim for that. It has to be a field of science and technology. They have to be going over and above an industry baseline. So they can't be working to bring themselves up to the, the standards within their industry, they've got to be going over and above that and doing something and uh, doing something interesting, something innovative. They've got to be making technical advance. So they've got to be advancing knowledge in a field of science and technology in some way, however small. They've got to be generating new knowledge that no one ever knew. Um, and on the way to doing this, they've got to um, encounter these technical challenges. So they can't have been able to go from where they are now to the advance without any difficulty. Um, and obviously the last thing and something HMRC particularly hot on is competent professionals. So there has to be people with knowledge and or experience of that area of science and technology that are leading the work, directing subcontractors, generally um, resolving those challenges. Um, and before we jump into the main bulk of this, just a wee talk about HMRC and acceptance of claims. Um, I put this in because anytime we talk about eligibility, I can feel our listeners going, oh, but someone I know managed to get a claim for that kind of thing. Um, and HMRC accepts it. The sort of thinking about HMRC and acceptance, acceptance is actually fairly meaningless in terms of um, R&D tax relief claims. It's really unlikely they read or check every claim in detail. It's more likely now, but still very unlikely. Um, and the process before, if we just ignore what happened over the summer, the process appears to be that tax returns are checked, credits paid out, and then further checking is done for some claims. And we're seeing that again now, actually, where HMRC are sending out their standard letters saying, we are going to be looking at your R&D, or we have looked at it, and we've got some questions. So you can't say with certainty that HMRC has accepted a claim unless it's been through inquiry. Once you've gone through an inquiry and you've answered all their questions, it has been accepted. Up until that point, all you can ever say is they haven't asked questions yet. So the 
guy that you spoke to who spoke to someone in the pub who got a uh, claim through for a care home all that means is that HMRC haven't looked at it in detail yet and if they did they would almost certainly have a lot of questions so just to say that acceptance is fairly meaningless and you have to do every claim as if HMRC are going to read it in detail so I'm going to pass over to Ian for a moment. Thanks, Jen. Um, so I suppose one of the biggest questions is why do you want to take control of your clients' uh, R&D claims? Um, so there's a couple of reasons, and probably the basis behind all of this is confidence and security, really. Um, we've noticed it's no big secret since the start of um uh, May, June of this year, that HMRC are starting to be a bit more um, uh, rigid and a bit more stringent in um, reviewing claims. So everything paused back in May. They started um, investigating more and more claims. Subsequently, we know that they were investigating a very large scale fraud, but obviously that included most of the claims that were going through the system at the time. So they've, they've really started to kind of look at claims in a bit more detail. And with that, they are referring back to the guidance all the time, and they're a bit more kind of um, compliant with the guidance. Uh, there's less grey areas with it. OK, so uh, from that perspective, if you're somebody who's up to speed with, with, with the guidance, then you can obviously steer your client in the, in the correct direction with that as well. Um, and it gives you confidence that, you know, if you've taking control of it that you know that should it go to inquiry that you're happy enough to be able to deal with HMRC um, and stand up for the for, for the claim that you've put it put in place um, ultimately that's then going to lead to a happy client um, who is happy to give you the, the repeat business and then you know obviously they've had a good experience um, and going forward as well cool thanks Ian so when you're getting into the topic of this, what we were thinking about is how you could review your client portfolio. Um, and the main, the first step to take obviously is to divide your clients and potentially the prospects into the three main categories you're going to have there. So you'll have companies that are already claiming. Um, they're usually the easiest, but generally you'll know some of them are claiming, have done claims recently. You'll have companies that have claimed in the past, but aren't claiming now for whatever reason we'll get into that in a bit more detail and obviously you'll have companies that have never claimed i'm always surprised by how many companies out there are out there that have never claimed given when you see the numbers of claims and the amount of marketing that's done um i'm always surprised when you find companies that are completely naive to the scheme but they are out there there's quite a lot of them so each of those sort of categories of clients and companies the approach is slightly different the way to kind of review that chunk of your client base is different because there's different things to look for um the thing to remember is obviously all of these clients, all of these companies will have been approached by phone, by email, in some way by R&D providers. Some of those have been good providers. Some of those might be less good providers. They will have an idea. They will have their own prejudices, their own biases about R&D tax relief and what it should be, what it could be and that kind of thing. So you need to be able to overcome the feelings they have about R&D tax relief as well on, in your approach to them. Um. So jumping in, first of all, we're going to talk about clients that are currently claiming. And I'm trying to remember which of us is doing this slide. I think it's me. Uh, <laughs> so big things to consider if the client's current, you have a client that's currently claiming. First thing is who did their most recent claim? If it was you, then we don't even need to talk anymore. Um, if you did the most recent claim, it should just be a check in with them and say, hey, you're still doing some work. You're still doing eligible things. Great. On we go. Um, on the assumption, obviously, that you gave a really good service the first time, which I think is fair to assume. If you didn't prepare the claim, then you've got a slightly more difficult thing to do where you need to look at the claim that they did do, if you can get hold of the documents, um, and just assess that so that check that you are happy and confident that they are eligible. If you are, again, feel free to approach them. That's great. They're an easy sell. If they're not eligible, or if you feel the claim was put together well, or you can see some glaring emissions in it, that can be a really difficult conversation. Um, but it is an important one to have. What you don't want 
if you've got a client who's claiming it shouldn't be and are really opening themselves up to a huge risk of an inquiry, you need to be able to have that conversation that says, look, I know you've claimed successfully in the past, HMRC have paid out, but here are the reasons why I don't think you're eligible. Can we discuss them? Can we talk that through? Um, and the final thing to really think about is the work that they actually claimed for. Was that ongoing work? Do you know that they, those projects were continuing? Or was this a company that did one project once and actually they're not a very technical company and they're never going to do anything again. That can help you at least prioritize. Obviously, we'd always want to speak to them, but again, in prioritizing, thinking about which ones had ongoing work, which ones were, were for which ones are doing a one off project is important. Ian. Thanks, Jen. Um, so if you've got clients then that are already uh, claiming through somebody else, it's important to kind of take a step back and wonder why did they not come through you in the first place um why are they doing it with somebody else that's perfectly fine if we go back you know maybe five or six years very few accountancy firms um or um, um business advisors had any real expertise in r d and there was a whole um industry basically kind of sprouted up um advising people on this and doing r&d claims so that it, it's fine to kind of to know that you didn't get that work because of that reason but it's very easy now to invest in training new systems whisper claims offer training to all our subscribers um and we um obviously if you use our platform it's a very very simple way of putting together an r&d claim so if you can explain to your client that look it's something new to me, but we've invested in this, we've got a new system in place, then it becomes a much better value proposition um, to be able to come to your client with. Um, if it's part of a, a general service that you're offering, obviously, you know, in terms of value, you could be uh, coming in with a, a better fee structure because you're doing lots of other things like their, 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 their general tax returns or their personal tax returns, whatever it might be, you can come in with a better fee structure in that sense as opposed to a one-off product. But also as a um, as somebody who they've already engaged with for other business advice, you're obviously coming in with a, a you know with a bit more trust in that sense. So again, as far as a value proposition is concerned, you know you're you're in a much better place than somebody who's just you know set a telemarketing company loose on you instead. Um, in terms of actually working with them, then you, you know you, you're in a position where you can coach them through a process better. So. You know, one way that you could approach them is to kind of say, look, let me have a look at your your, your current claim. OK, um, take a step back from it and look and say, realistically, I'm no expert, but does the science look challenging? You know, does it look like they're advancing in their field of, of technology? And if it, if it doesn't, then be that person who stands in and kind of goes, I'm not entirely happy with this um you know maybe we should do a review on it you know the science might be one thing do the figures look realistic are they overinflated are they under quoted um do you reckon they've spent more time than they've actually um accounted for in that sense or are they missing categories of of of, of uh, expenditure as well are they not putting in software costs or whatever it might be into that so if you understand the r d scheme then you can actually come up with a um um a better um, proposition to your client where you can coach them through the process as well. Next slide. So if we look at then the other opportunities, clients who've already claimed, um, things that you should probably ask is, okay, so why did they stop um, making claims? Um, is it because they know they're not or think they're not undertaking R&D anymore? People tend to get hung up with uh, with projects, and once the project is over, they kind of go, "Well, that's it done. We're not doing any more." I hear quite a lot um, from some of our subscribers when they say, "Well, we did a claim in 2019, but you know, they, that's the, the project is over with." There may be other work that's ongoing that they haven't spoken about again. Um, often, what happens is when the senior people in the company leave, um, the relationship with the, the advisor either goes or the new people coming in are not aware of what, what R&D actually is. Um, and obviously that needs to be addressed as well. Um, and obviously people know that claiming for R&D is quite a, a lengthy process or can be a very lengthy process. And some of the people, if, if, if they're relied on quite heavily to put in all the legwork, they kind of just go, 
it's too much of my time evolving for the size of the claim that we're getting out. I just, I don't really feel that the value of it anymore. Um, and that can also then, that whole thing can lead to a bad experience. Either that they felt as though they were doing too much work for the, the value of the claim, or you know they may have gone to an inquiry and, and really don't want the hassle of it again. You know, so these are all opportunities for you to be able to step in and kind of go, well, let's have a look at it again and we'll see what we can do for you going forward. Um, one of the best ways as an advisor of been able to approach your clients is to ask to review the, the past claims. You know, explain to them that you're now using a technology which is able to streamline the process. You've invested in the training that we spoke about earlier on. Um, and this will give you um, the ability to be able to sit with them and to go through the, the upcoming changes in the legislation and to put, put them a bit more um, confident in what they're actually claiming for. Um, and then, as I say earlier on, just on the last slide, is to make sure they're not getting um, caught up on just the projects. Things that would have been eligible in the past are not necessarily eligible now and vice versa as well. So if you're up to, up to date with it, with the legislation, then you can feel more confident going back to your client um, in, in that sense. Okay, next slide. So another category is people who've never claimed. Um, and obviously this is probably what this whole um, course is, is, is really aimed at. It's, it's a, tapping into that. Uh, the low-hanging fruit. Um, they're probably the most difficult to assess um, insofar as there's a reason why they've never claimed before. Have they been approached or have they not been approached by, by another company? Um, are they um, risk-averse? So there's, there's, there's many different things to kind of consider in that sense. Um, but this is where the biggest opportunity is. Um, and the best way to do is, is have a look at your, your client list Everybody knows that it's easier to get work from somebody you already deal with as opposed to going out and find new work from a new client. So if you already have this portfolio of clients sitting there, look at it, spend a bit of time reviewing it and see who you think might be eligible. Um, and the best way to do that is, is to have a look at things like um, the, the SIC, the, the standard, standard industry classification. Um, that's a really good indicator of what they do fits into a field of science and technology, obviously, which is where the, the basis of, of, of R&D is. It's not always the case though. So another way of doing it is having a look at their accounts. Um, have they invested in, um, are, are they spending a lot of money in subcontracting? Um, have they invested in new machinery? Have they invested in new technology? Um, and then other things as well. I mean, have they made, um, Sorry, are they taking on new staff in a more technical role? So just to be aware of, of those sort of things, they're all um, little flags that we should look at when we're, when we're assessing companies for, for research and development. Um, as I said earlier on, SIC codes, probably one of the biggest areas, that the first thing that we would look at. And the first thing also, if HMRC are curious about a claim this is one of the big areas that they'll focus on to say well actually that company doesn't really fit in what we would imagine will be an r d company so we should also assess it from both sides of it as well uh, so it's it's not an exact science um and we've got kind of to, to give an, an example of what we mean there we've got a table there with some sick codes and how we would assess them for risk so zero being zero risk and three being a high high risk um we look at the first table there you've got manufacturer of industrial gases, research and experimental developments and biotechnology, um, whereas it goes right the way down the line to wholesale of solid, liquid and gaseous fuel. So same industry, but very different classification as to what they're actually doing. They're in the industrial gases um, industry, but one is wholesaling, the other is manufacturing and developing. So very, very different ends of, of the spectrum there from that perspective. So if we look at the accounts um, again. It's it's you know it's it's interpretive. Um, all companies will have different ways of reporting um, in their accounts as well. Um, but as I said earlier on, good indications of companies undertaking some R and D will be 
if they actually have costs attributed to R&D, so they actually have a, a, a separate line in, in their accounts for R&D. It's quite common, believe it or not. Um, identify if they've got grants. If they've got grants, what are the grants for? Um, is it just for, you know, obviously is it something to do with like furlough or uh, business interruption, or is it a little bit more technical? Um, so understand more about the grants, um, and then that can lead to conversations about, well, what were you planning to do with the money? Um, you know, is it development of a new product, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as I mentioned, large subcontractor costs, are they developing something that they don't have enough manpower within the company to, to get this over the line on, on their own? So they're spending lots of money um, to other, um, paying other companies to help in with that. That's usually quite a good indicator that they, um, they um, have some R&D going on. Obviously, again, not an exact science because a lot of companies, a lot of industries such as, you know, construction will have a lot of subcontractor costs, but it's not guaranteed that the construction firm will have any R&D going on. But it's just one of those little flags again. Um, and then a really good one is a, 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 a disproportionate increase in raw material spend on that year. It could be just that they were up in production, or it could be that they were testing something, trying something out, and they were coming across a lot of failure, destroying products, um, wasting materials. Um, and obviously, you know, that will fall into category of prototyping um, or destroying something in the in the R&D process to, to come up with a, a, a viable solution. Um, again, if you see those type of costs, that's the type of thing you should be asking the question. Oh, what were you what were you trying to achieve um, with, 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 with this? Um, and then very, very obviously, if somebody has a, a patents on their books or they're um, they're paying for patent attorneys, then obviously they've got something that is um, definitely got some R&D if it's, if it's patentable. Um, other indications that they've got R&D are the, the type of staff that are employed by the company. Some companies will categorize their staff. Um, if, if the client is in your portfolio, one of the things that I used to always do is kind of look at their website sometimes and just see what they've got going on with their um, with the recruitment. A lot of companies will have their their recruitment advertised on their own websites, and if you can see somebody that's you know being recruited for a technical role, it's good to know that they've got people there for that reason. Therefore, it's worth a conversation. Um, again, they often describe the type of work that they do on their website because that's their 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 you know that's their their shop front. Um, so if they're, if they're describing the type of work that, that, that you're doing and it, it sounds technically difficult, difficult to you, then it's worth just a conversation. Um, but they could be leaders, obviously, in their, in their industry. And, you know, that's definitely something that would, would be, a, be a big flag. Um, and if other companies come to them for advice, it will demonstrate that they have um, the competent professionals um, in their industry um, that other people look to advice for. So therefore, they've, chances are they've got um, some decent R&D going on as well. Oops. Oh, sorry. You all right? Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> no problem. So looking at clients then that have never claimed, all right, how do we approach these guys? It should be quite simple. Um, as a, a business advisor, chances are you're doing something um, that would lead you to have um, regular conversations with your client. If you're an accountant, you should be sitting down and having an annual review with them, discussing what their plans are for the year, reviewing what went on last year. Are they going to invest money this year? What are they going to invest in? Um, and during those reviews, you know, the, it should always be brought up, are you investing in new uh, technology, new people? Um, do you know what R&D is? You know, if you're not saying it, somebody else is going to come along and say it anyway. So it might as well come from you as a trusted advisor. OK, so an annual review, just drop it into the conversation. But definitely, I would always bring up the conversation again ahead of finder accounts. If you're doing the tax comps, you might as well have a conversation. With, Did you spend any money on R&D this year? Let me explain what R&D is so that we can maybe um, reduce your tax bill or better again, um, even get you some cash back. And again, it's worth um, you brushing up on, on the uh, the legislation as well, so that when you're asking, like, did you do any R&D, they turn around and go, no. Um, 
effectively you have to take their word for it but if they don't really know what the definition of r d is then it's hard for them to understand um sorry if you don't know what the definition of r d is then it's hard for you to kind of challenge them on what their understanding is so but just kind of brushing up on the legislation it's it's um it, it makes it easier for you to be able to have these conversations so what do we know um well we can help out with that um we have a basically a team of in-house people who've been involved in, in R&D for um, more than 10 years, most of us. Um, uh, if any of you are subscribers, you may have been in touch with the support channel, and the support channel is basically me and Jen. Uh, both of us have been involved in R&D for, for more than 10 years, um, from um, you know the actual putting together of claims, submitting claims. Um, so if you ever need to get in touch with us, you can be assured that you've got um, people who've probably been involved in something you're involved in right now as well. Um, to help you uh, generate new fees, we recently started the portfolio review service. Um, and the idea behind that is to basically work with you on your portfolio. So if you've got um, a list of clients who you've never spoken to about R&D, we're happy to look at your portfolio with you. Uh, to try and see what you're missing out on. We produce reports. Um, it's easy to read through, but it gives you some tips and tricks as to how to actually approach the, the particular clients that we've we've identified you should be involved in R&D. Um, and that comes on, again, years and years of, of, of working in R&D claims across pretty much every sector you can think of. Um, and we've worked on claims that are in the thousands of pounds to the millions of pounds. So again, no matter who, what client you're dealing with, um, or that we highlight to you, we'll probably have dealt with that client at some or that type of client at some point, and be able to give some good advice on it. And then, obviously, as a Whisper Claim subscriber, you have access to our award-winning software. <laughs> um, shameless pitch there. Um, it's very, very simple to use, and it's it's a great tool for even just screening out clients to say that, yes, they're not even eligible, or yes, they are eligible. Um, it's easy to follow. It's 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 very, very straightforward. You basically ask a structured set of questions that are, which are on screen and, and fill, in, fill in the boxes that are um, you're asked, asking the questions about. Um, again, because we have worked in the industry so long, we know what qualifies, you know what don't, doesn't qualify, but also we keep it updated with any legislative changes from HMRC as well. So every time um, the government and HMRC announce any changes, we'll um, adapt the system to make sure that we're in line with that. That's all for me, Suze. So you haven't done one of these for a while, I'm still on mute. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Thank you both. That was uh, that was great. Lots of really great advice and um, information there. Um, we'll be moving to questions in just a moment. So I can see we've got one waiting. Um, if anybody's got any questions while I um, just talk to you about some things that are coming up, um, please do start filling out the Q&A box and we'll get to them in just a moment. Um, so um, as, as Jen and Ian have both mentioned, and as anybody who's uh, been to these events before or who's a subscriber knows, we do run um, a monthly course um, called the Fund fundamentals of the R&D tax uh, relief scheme. Um, this is for anybody who is either new to the scheme or uh, is also suitable for anybody who is looking to maybe brush up on their knowledge um, about eligibility, the scheme and some of its nuances. And we do have a session on Tuesday next week. So if anybody's keen to get going, um, please do feel free to book in. I'll be popping the links to everything that I'm speaking about um, in just a moment in the chat box. So um, take a look there. Um, next, Jen, I think we have, um, yep, just a, another reminder, uh, we are on YouTube. <laughs> this is exciting for us, but we have been here for um, uh, most of this year now, actually. So um, this is just a place for um, you to um, access um, our video podcast and collaboration content in one place um, and enable you to watch back and enjoy it at your leisure. Um, if you're a subscriber to Whisper Claims, you can access the um, uh, eligibility webinars through our exclusive insights channel. 
anyone who is a subscriber should already have a link to that. If you are a subscriber and do not have a link to that and would like it, please do let me know um, by dropping me a message in just a moment and I will organize that for you. Um, and finally, if there is anybody um, who is on the session today who has not um, already seen um, a demo of the system is and interested, uh, please do just um, drop me a message um, or navigate to the website and book a demo um, from there. It will be myself probably that will be running that for you. So um, I look forward to seeing anybody who would like to do that. Okay, that's it from me. Um, let's get to questions. Um, I'm not sure who's going to kick this one off. Should I, should I go ahead and read it out? You guys can decide who wants to. Go ahead, Sus. <laughs> so uh, question, uh, what would you advise if a client sent through a previous claim document they made with an alternative firm and you felt that it was not qualifying work, i.e. that their previous claim was fraudulent? I think the best thing is just tell them, for starters. Um, two, two reasons. One, they may expect you to replicate what they've done already going forward. Um, which obviously you wouldn't be comfortable with doing, but if you can explain to them that you you feel as though it was non-qualifying, um, that it probably you wouldn't have felt comfortable submitting it yourself. Um, it puts you in a slightly awkward position, but it puts you in a kind of a moral high ground with the client. And as your as their advisor, they're looking to you for the correct advice. The danger you're going to have is they probably got paid out on that claim, which, as Jen touched on at the start of this, is no indication it has been accepted and HMRC can still turn around in, in years to come and want that money back. Um, so my best advice on it is take the moral high ground with your client, explain to them that given your, 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 your knowledge of, of, of the scheme that you don't believe um, that the work that they had previously submitted for was actually eligible. Anything you want to add to that, Jen? Yeah, so we, it is obviously a really awkward thing if you're looking at a previous claim and you're like, this is not right. I suppose the one of the, the question about, you know, if you think it's actually fraudulent is a very difficult one. Obviously, there's misguided, there's people didn't quite understand the scheme, all that kind of thing. The difficulty, obviously, is if your client it's their claim and they've signed off on it, you would hope and expect. You don't want to be shopping your own clients to HMRC for tax fraud either. Obviously, nobody wants to do this. Um, in terms of, uh, I can see they've got, well, you know, what should the client do? Notify HMRC. I mean, the client could go to HMRC and withdraw the claim. There's a danger there that HMRC will say, well, why was this fraudulent claim submitted? Who's liable for that? Let's talk about fines. That can happen. Um, so it's a really difficult one to advise on because a lot of the time claims aren't, let's say fraudulent is a really big word, <laughs> misguided and not very robust, not very defensible is a different thing where people made mistakes, people misapplied the guidelines, that kind of thing. And in those circumstances, if a client is very worried, they could go to HMRC and withdraw it, pay it back and explain to HMRC that they were given bad advice. They'd probably be okay doing that. Um, we as a company have a couple of times reported people for fraud, but those were more, it was very blatant and it wasn't kind of our clients that were being affected. So we were kind of, I suppose, safe to do that reporting and HMC were very thankful that we did. Um, so I don't think we've got a definite, you should do this. Um, it's really down to you, your relationship with the client and the risk that you see in them either withdrawing or leaving the claim as is with HMRC. Thanks, guys. I think that second question was um, in relation to the first one, and I think Helen in have just answered that one there as well. So um, do let us know if you want any more um, clarification on that to um, the person who asked that question. Um, we do have a question from Rachel. Um, uh, thanks, Rachel. So thank you, Jenny and Sue. Great that your software has received awards. Which awards are they, please? <laughs> I'm only laughing. Are we paying for that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to talk about it. I'm only laughing because I can literally, like behind my screen, see the awards that we've had. So we, we've had an Accounting Excellence Award, which I can't from here remember exactly what category that was. Uh, we won an award in the UK Business Tech Awards, and we had an award from the Scottish Accounting and Financial Technology Awards. Um, so mostly around 
it was kind of fintechy type things we were winning awards for. Uh, that's great. Yeah, we're really proud of those awards as well. And I think as uh, Mike would say, it's, it was great to be recognized um, from the sort of tech side, um, uh, tech world, and also from the accountancy world as well. So that's, uh, that's uh, we're really proud of those. But they're, they're just the ones we've actually won. We've been uh, runners up on many, many occasions as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but that's where people say, we're, we're, I often get asked by marketing, you know, which uh, claims have you been out for what we nominated for, or sorry, awards them. Can't remember. I'll have to go back through my emails. Let me troll through. <laughs> but yeah, we have sat in many, many a, um, an award ceremony and listened to the same jokes with the same comedian more times than I'd like to admit. <laughs> okay. Well, you're all very quiet today. Um, hopefully that means that Jen and Ian gave you um, all the advice that you needed and you didn't have any questions. Um, if anybody does have anything uh, that they want to ask, please do feel free to um, pop it in the box. We do have a few more minutes left um, just while we're waiting for anyone to furiously type. Um, we obviously, as I will say, we obviously do have a schedule of content that we um, come up with um, uh, month by month to try and, um, you know, keep you all up to date with um, new stuff, but also, you know, um, sessions around eligibility in certain areas as well. If there is anything that we haven't covered and anybody would like to hear um, our take on things, then um, please do um, drop us a message um, using the contact details um, that you have in front of you and, and let us know because we're always very happy to um, uh, try to make sure that we are uh, pro providing content that's interesting and, and, and relevant to our audience. Um, okay, so there aren't any more questions now. Um, I think that might be us today. I don't know, unless Jenna, if you've got anything else you'd like to add? Oh, hang on, we've got one. No, oh, there we go. Well, well, Rachel's typing. Oh, I was just going to hi highlight, that obviously, you know, I both mentioned around the legislative changes coming in next April. So we are currently working on the updates to the app for that. So the app team are just working out exactly what we're going to be doing. Um, and we will obviously um, be doing some webinars and some more content around exactly what that means, exactly what updates we've made, all that kind of thing. Some just for subscribers so we can talk through the changes to the app and some for everyone around the changes that you have to make processes and that kind of thing. So that will be coming up just in case anyone had questions about suddenly hundreds of questions coming in. Uh, just in case anyone did have questions about the new legislation, we will be covering that off in future sessions. Uh, so Rachel's questions come there and we've got another couple of other ones. So Rachel, thank oh. you. Um, would you be able to give um, a guide as to what percentage of claims for your system have gone to inquiry, please? So this again, it's a bit of a difficult question because we're that little bit removed. So we only know about the inquiries that we're told about. Um, as far as we can tell, it's a really low percentage, similar number to any other kind of uh, tax advisor. So normally... Anyone you speak to, any R&D tax company will say that about 1% to 2% of claims will go into inquiry in any year. We we think we see about the same. As I say, we don't know because we learn about the ones that, that speak to us or highlight it to us. But it's definitely about the average for the industry, if not a little bit lower. Okay. We've got quite a broad one here that I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'll read it out, but um, I'll let you guys answer it. So um, who can claim and what can be claimed by, by whom? <laughs> Uh, really, really, really quick elevator pitch on this. Any company that's liable for tax, for corporation tax, uh, must be incorporated, so no sole traders. Uh, and they can claim for any scientific or technical advancement, um, particularly within their industry, that's being led by a competent professional, i.e. somebody who knows what they're doing. So in other words, if I'm a restaurateur and I'm claiming for software, as a chef, I am not an expert in software. I can claim for software potentially, but I would need to demonstrate that I had somebody on my staff who knew what they were doing and they were developing a software app for my menu or whatever it might be. Um, uh, the, 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 the advancements must be difficult. It mustn't be something that's really easy to, to kind of come up with a solution to. So they would, H4C would like to, to hear that you, you took a, a bit of time to think about it and uh, it ne didn't necessarily go right the first time. Uh, and then what can be claimed for is usually staff, um, external provided workers and subcontractors, uh, software costs, materials that you consume during the R&D process, um, which includes prototypes, and uh, light and heat, a portion of your light and heat. 
I will say though, that is a really big question and it is answered in our two hour training session. <laughs> it usually takes us two hours to explain that. So I'm impressed Ian did it in a minute and a half. Elevator pitch. Yeah. And we've got a session on Tuesday next week if you want to join. <laughs> Um, so we've got a question about the um, upcoming legislation and guidance, one of the one of the new um, pieces of info. So does the new legislation mean that claimants who haven't claimed before will need to give six months notice of a claim? And does that mean that retrospective claims can't be made? Basically, I don't want to say this with you, is that OK? Yeah, go on, go on. Uh, essentially, yes. Um, what it means is if a client's never claimed or hasn't claimed in the last three years, if they claimed 10 years ago, they would still count. They need to tell HMRC they're going to make a claim within six months of the end of the accounting period. So they have, if they haven't done that, the draft legislation says they would not be able to make a claim. I'm slightly skeptical of this actually being implemented the way it's written at the moment, but we'll see. We also don't have any clarification from HMRC on what form this notification is going to take, how they're going to do it. They've said they're building a system for it, whether it's simply going to be a tick box or whether this is going to be a form that needs filled out with information about the projects, we just don't know yet. Um, but yeah, in short, it's going to stop retrospective claims being made because they can't have been, um, the HMRC can't have been notified. One thing to note, though, is again, at the moment, and this might change, this only applies to claim periods starting on or after the 1st of April. So if you've got a client with a 31st March year end you don't it shouldn't affect or anything earlier than that it, they shouldn't need to give notification it's only for claims starting after that again that might change as the legislation goes to different versions um and what i have seen before with some of the legislation around that for extended accounting periods the extended part might be caught so we'll clarify this as and when we've got more um, detail from HMRC but yeah at the moment no respective claim no retrospective claims and they have to inform HMRC within six months something that I had a conversation with an ex-colleague of mine um, a few days ago about this was that you don't need to actually make the claim in that year you just need to notify within six months of the financial year ending that you're intending to make a claim for that year which could mean and this is up for debate at the moment that it could mean that in two years' time, you could retrospectively claim for that period because within the six months, you did notify HMRC. So what their understanding of it is is that it may be just a line that is put into their accounts every year mm -hmm. within the normal explanation of you know accounting basis, et cetera, et cetera, that they may put in that they intend to make a claim for R&D. They don't have to follow through on that, but it may be that they, they may wish to make a claim for R&D. That might negate that worry but as i say the actual legislation hasn't been finalized yet so we'll see how that looks and as ian says if it's i don't know how hmrc are going to get around the fact that if i was doing claims on behalf of clients i would just then notify hmrc for all of them every year on the off chance they were doing some so the, i don't know whether they're going to mechanism to stop people just blanket notifying as well which as i say i would do that if there was a risk Clients are going to lose out on claims. I would notify them about everything. So it's interesting to see what comes through over the next six months and actually what they decide to do with it. Very good point. Great stuff. Um, okay, well, we've got a minute left. If anybody has any last <laughs> last moment questions, um, feel free to pop those in. Um, but if not, just a big thank you to... Um, everyone who's joined today as usual um it's really great to have um so much engagement from the audience so thank you everyone for the questions as well um i think i'll I think i'll make a call and say that'll be it for today Are you good with that guys yep. yeah, all good. yeah all right well enjoy the rest of your tuesday everybody um as we said any feedback greatly appreciated so do get in touch and look out for our next session next month oh there we go another question that always happened oh thank you karen <laughs> okay well that'll be us from today take care everybody and we'll speak to you soon